I mean, the pot, San, Dra San Diego Padres change their uniforms every so often to upgrade up yeah. them and make them a little different color. If I, I get remember, on I remember a great analogy he told a uh, newscaster one time. She was talking about showbiz and wrestling. He said, let me tell you, I've got this great idea. He said, come to the ring, we'll get these five scantily clad young ladies to bring a cannon down there. And when I win the fall, he said, uh, I'm going to have them jump up and cheer, and they're going to fire that cannon. He said, what do you think of that? She said, why, why, that's bizarre. He said, I know. And he said, what I just told you about was a Dallas Cowboy scoring a touchdown. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just what you're, you know, it's no. But Same we went beyond that. We went beyond that. We're we're out of that. We're into another. Well, yeah, now it's yeah, we're beyond that. Yeah, the Dallas Cowboys are too. <laughs> we got Junior. That <laughs> they've got more there. serious and we're goofy. <laughs> Look at those toes there. They're pretty ones. Those are good looking toes. Obviously, Cherry. Well, we certainly have dress for you. Didn't yeah. put any of it in clothes. <laughs> you're, you're, <laughs> I remember when you were a clothes horse years ago. <laughs> clothes hog, yeah. Hoss. Clothes hog. Yes. Male clothes model. Man. Terry Funk with his legs. Male and model, yeah. Make a slight adjustment on one line. All right. Okay. Now I'll open this, Alan, is uh, our guest on Wrestlers I Have You Today. I might move up here in just a, a little bit. In a sport yeah. of uh, many records broken uh, in rapid pace, they hold a record that will never be broken, probably. What is the that only, record? The only brothers to hold okay, good. the World Heavyweight Championship. <laughs> okay. Unless the NWA makes a resurgent and uh, all the Crockett brothers well, I don't know, or something somebody... run in and become champions. For that. <laughs> and I, you know, I want to get into something on that too, where, uh, for, again, for the younger fans who wouldn't be aware of that, legitimately the NWA had affiliates in Europe and in. South America and Japan, and you, when you said you were the world's champion, you went to other countries. You went every place. Sure. You went everywhere. Exactly. I guess I must have, well, every night, within a week, you wrestle six different people. No. No, now they might wrestle. Or within a month, you, guys you wrestle. Year. Within a month. 35 times. Sure. Which, even from an entertainment standpoint, was more difficult because each yeah. regional area yeah. enjoyed different styles and, and different paced uh, types of action. It was much more, much more refreshing to wrestle different people all the time. So you, instead of, instead of, who are you going to refer to first? Well, I want to introduce, both brothers? Yeah, I want to introduce, okay, the, just so, introduce the, yeah. So we'll do the three shot, okay, and then we'll press into a two shot, and the guy Too tight in there. I give you my shoes. Oh my God! Damn, I'm, I'm four keep, sizes too small. There we go. Okay. Now I'm okay. Have a okay, phone. we're gonna have fun. All right. Thank I'm you, gonna sir. time this some a bitch too, <laughs> Les. Yeah, I'm saying. Okay, let's go. <clears throat> Welcome to Wrestlers Eye View. I'm Les Thatcher, and today's guests have a unique distinction in professional wrestling. Records are set and broken sometimes overnight. These two gentlemen hold a record I don't believe will ever be broken in the history of our sport. They are Dory Funk Jr. and Terry Funk, brothers who have both held the National Wrestling Alliance World Heavyweight title. And gentlemen, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. And uh, I'd like to say this, that record that you talk about, I've always been very, very proud of because for to come out of the same family with a father who was a professional wrestler and for both of his kids uh, to become world's champion uh, really makes me real proud for my family and for my father and my mother and for what they did for us. Well, I think it should and I, I think you have every right to be proud. Terry, let me start with you and let's go back to your child. Wait a minute, hold on a second there, Les. I'm putting this on the clock here because I know how <laughs> fluent you are with words and you said that we were going to be out of here at a certain time. I'm giving you an hour of my time starting right now. Whoops, with, I stopped it. There's anybody but it's going right now. Don't you. worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> there's anybody can right. talk to me. I right, know, ask me whatever you want to, but you've got to ask me fast now. All right, I've only got okay. 59 and a half minutes to go. Okay. All right. Exactly. Let's go back to when you guys were kids. And I know I, I've, I've known you both for years. You're extremely competitive. Were you that competitive with each other? 
uh, when you were kids. <laughs> Absolutely. I was very competitive with him, but I was always a loser, it seemed like. You know? <laughs> well, that's that's what a, it's supposed to be with younger brothers. Well, I think it is, really. It really is. You know, as you just can't quite whip that older brother, and that was the same way with me and him, you know. But believe me, I tried a lot of times, you know, and uh, mom and pop would have to come in there and break it up, you know, and whenever <laughs> pop wasn't involved in it. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth. When it, when it started out, I was about this tall, and he was about this tall. You know, so you got a pretty good advantage then. You, you swing. But down. whenever, whenever that, whenever that uh, it starts <laughs> growing together like that, well, when you when it gets about right there, you decide you're going to stop competing and shake his hand and join the same team. <laughs> let's make it a tag. Then it works out pretty good. Yeah, right. yeah, very good, very good. All right, let's discuss a little bit about your athletic backgrounds now. I know through uh, high school you guys were like any other kids at that time. You played all the ball sports. And you both went on to West Texas State and played mm -hmm. football. Uh, what position did you play? With? I was defensive end, end offensive end. And, I, you know, I really kind of hate to say this, but back in those days uh, you played both ways. Which is and, unheard uh, of now. Of it's kind of unheard mm -hmm. of now, yeah. And, and some things I really liked about it, it gave you uh, – a more rounded look at uh, football. Football was the sport that you were playing. Seen it, it you learned everything, right. sure. Exactly. Yeah. Terry, how about yourself? Well, that's, you know, just like Junior, I went ahead and went to West Texas State University. I think that Junior had a lot more scholarships than what I did because, again, we're talking about a size situation, and he graduated from high school a lot larger than what I did. And they, he had a lot of colleges looking for him, and he made the choice of going to West Texas State. and. Uh, I graduated from high school at just 155 pounds, and I was a lot smaller. And, and the only place that I could get a, a, a scholarship to was uh, Cisco Junior College. But I then made my way up to West Texas. You know, and my grades weren't quite as outstanding as his either. You know, and <laughs> he could go to any university in the country, including Rice and Yale and all these other things. Because believe me, he was brilliant. And uh, you owe him money. I couldn't. No, 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 I'm just telling you the truth. I'm, you know, well. I'm, well, look what I turned out to be, though. <laughs> what, what was that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm saying. But if we, we look back at it, if we look back at it, though, really? uh, the one thing about it is, Les, is that we started wrestling at a very young age because we started at five or six years old and amateur and went all the way through high school and all the way through college. We were never forced into the profession by my father, but I want to ask he, you welcomed, us, he welcomed, yeah. welcomed us into From it. From the time you arms. were both aware of what Dory Sr. did for a living, that he was a professional wrestler. Did it ever occur to either one of you to be anything else other than a professional wrestler in your lives? Well, for my part, uh, as I finished college, I was playing football. A uh, couple of kids uh, married, and uh, it was pretty tough to live on, even back then, $50 a month. That's what, <laughs> that's what we got for living off campus, along with a scholarship, you know, which was really worth a lot of money. But uh, wrestling kind of happened for me. Uh, uh, I was in school in those days. If you were uh, an amateur athlete, you couldn't be a professional athlete. So I had to finish my right. college eligibility first. And uh, I really didn't give a lot of thought at that time to whether I was going to be a professional wrestler. I was working construction along the way through college. And, I, and that would have probably been the natural way to go. But. Uh, uh, my father talked to me, the local promoter talked to me, and uh, after uh, we played in the Sun Bowl, which is now the John Hancock Bowl, I believe, down in El Paso, Texas, my eligibility was over and I was still in school, still living on $50 a month plus what my father and mother would give me. So I had my first wrestling match and uh, all of a sudden in one night, back then, I made $140, you know. Wow. And I was still in school, so I just kept on going, and I, I just kind of, uh, I hate to say I fell into something because I grew up in a business, but it seemed to be the natural thing to, to do back then, and it's just continued all along, and it's, it seems like every time you think uh, you're near the end, another new door opens, and, and it always happens that way. And how about you? Brain surgeon? Did you ever consider being well, a brain I, surgeon? Well, I thought about it a lot, you know. <laughs> but I know last uh, around that time, 1967, uh, I started in 65, but 1967 as I went to Florida and found you down there. Of That's all right. Things. <laughs> I ran into Les Thatcher, the young Les Thatcher. But anyhow, as, uh, at that time, my goal in professional wrestling was to make $10,000 in one year, you know. And I can remember driving a lot of five, six hundred mile trips for twenty to thirty bucks, you know. Sure. And you can too, Les. And uh, we'd make those long trips and on, on those long road trips, and 
and uh, we loved the sport, but it, was, we, it wasn't that lucrative at that time. And, I, and like I said, ten thousand dollars was a lot of money. I mean, if you could, I couldn't even envision this. You know, making that kind of money. You know, and and now in this day and age, you couldn't even get along hardly on that. You know. Well, you know, we, we mentioned senior. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about his background. He was a legend in West Texas. Uh, tell a couple of stories about Ted. <laughs> Which one do you want to hear? <laughs> How much time did Terry's cut? Does he got us on the clock? You know, right? All right, I can take you any direction. <laughs> Wrestling's, a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a rough game. It's a, How about it's, a story? it's a dangerous game. You know, I'll, I'll, sure. I'll give the you one. We've heard. The way the way we learn to wrestle is, uh, well, first, uh, you know, like uh, four or five years old, he started an amateur. Myself, uh, seven, eight, nine years old, because I was a little older than Terry was. But as we got older, the way we really learned to wrestle and really do it well is my father would take us, he had a wrestling mat in his garage, and he'd take us down in that wrestling mat, he was a leg wrestler, and he'd use that old uh, top body scissors, right. he'd get on top of us, and he would stretch us until it hurt. And then, you know, he'd say, okay kid, fight out, you know, let's see if you can get away. And he would, he would do this, it's a rough way to learn, but you learn to wrestle good that way, because you build your win, you, you, you learn how to, how to stand pain too, pretty well. <laughs> and scream but, sometimes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I, I'll tell you one time, I was in the house and I heard the doggondest noise I ever heard. And uh, my father had that top body scissors on Terry. And there is, you know, for every hold there's a reversal and right. there's a way to reverse it. And luckily or, or whatever, but Terry reached up and double leg scissored my father's legs. And Terry's in the, just a little out of junior high school. And I heard the doggondest screaming and cussing and Terry had reversed the hole and had my father in pain. <laughs> I heard the doggone this cussing you ever heard in your life saying, doggone it, you better turn loose now, let me up. <laughs> and Terry was in the hole and he was saying, Dad, I can't let you up because if, if I let go, you're going to kick the living dog heck out of me, you know? <laughs> and the cussing and the screaming went on and finally, sure enough, Terry let go and sure enough, my, he let go my father just took him and just raked it over, you know, and just <laughs> took him back down and stretched him out good again, you know. So anyhow, that's kind of the way we grew up, you know, with... Uh, Tell the story about when Senior first went to Amarillo and won the state title and there was a, the main street had all the cowboy bars on it and I heard this story when I first broke into professional wrestling 30 some years ago about him walking in with a belt to try to build a business up in West Texas. And he'd say, I'm Dory Funk Sr. I'm the Texas heavyweight wrestling champion. And I can whip anybody in the place. And that's, I think that's been a legend in our business for years and years and years. Well, he believed that. And he, and he did. He could whip about any of them. And I'll tell you what. It wasn't just that he believed two it, of them, he did do it. Two right? of them that he could whip was me and him. You know? <laughs> but I'll tell you what, he was a very funny teacher and a very wonderful teacher. And, uh, but how he taught us in wrestling, when we turned professional, is we come out of the rings, and I've seen a lot of uh, uh, fathers, wrestling fathers that have second generation wrestlers and their sons in the wrestling business, and first thing they say is, he, wasn't he wonderful? Look at you my boy. Wonderful. Look at my boy, Look he my was boy so great. wonderful. Wasn't he so great, and he's gonna be so good and such a star. Well, that was just the opposite with Dory Funk Sr. We'd go ahead and come out of that ring and come to the dressing room. And he'd say, damn, what in the hell were you doing out there? That was the worst match I've ever seen in my life. Can't you do any better than that? And he would make these points of everything that we did wrong. He would never say that we did anything good. As long as I can remember him, and my brother and I have talked about this before, he'd never say that was good or this was good or anything else. But we knew that we had reached the point of success whenever we would come to that dressing room and he wouldn't say a thing and he could make you feel like a million dollars by just doing that to you and that's all he had to do. And he is a wonderful guy with kids. He was a wonderful individual. He was out there at Boys Ranch, Cal Farley's Boys Ranch. He took over out there whenever there was only uh, 140 kids out there but there was only like three, three or four adults in control of 140 kids that were anywhere from five to 18 years old and some very tough, rough, hardcore kids, and they needed to line them up back then, you know, and that's whenever he came down from Indiana, and he came out there, and, and Dory Funk Sr. lined those kids out, and I'll tell you what, as he turned some 
tough kids into wonderful kids. He had a way of teaching children. He made you live by the rules, by the regulations, but you love to please him, and that's what was so wonderful about him. Well, you know, one of the things I, I, I have to consider both of you, two of the most well-rounded athletes in our business uh, in, in my lifetime, and I think part of that must be the fact that is uh, a lot of the top pros of your dance time came through Amarillo. They also took you out in that garage, didn't they? Yes, they did. Absolutely. Yes, to, yes. to get taller Absolutely. from some of the toughest guys. Yes, in and, I, and I can uh, the, name them. Uh, Famous wrestler, some of the old timers out there might remember Dick Hutton, uh, Vern Gagne, uh, Bob Geigel, uh, Joe Scarpello, Joe Scarpello, Eddie Graham, Luthez, right? uh, Luthez yes. Uh, every time that a, that a really great professional wrestler would come through the area, he'd invite him out the house and say, Pat O'Connor too. He'd say, you gotta get out in the garage with these kids and show them a little bit. For those yeah, who don't know, we've talked about practically every major alliance's heavyweight champion in that period of time. Well, we've missed Race and some of them, but you know, as I, I'll tell you what, Race was a great champion too. You missed Briscoe because they kind of well, but came that, down yeah. into our area, right, but exactly. the back area, yeah. And you know, it's a funny thing, but Junior and I have been here around here a long time, and we can go back to all of the champions that we've we've probably competed against. More champions than anybody else. Oh, I would has. think so. I would think so. Uh, yeah. Over a longer period of time. Well, of course, let's let's talk about. And now. I haven't quite reached my prime. <laughs> <laughs> You're still but getting I'm there. Coming I'm around there any day. <laughs> you started first. You were the first one to turn pro. What kind of pressure did you feel because of who your father was and because of having trained with all these great pros we're talking about? If you didn't go out there and become world's champion in the first 15 minutes of your career, well, there is. There's really a lot of pressure. Uh, in following in the footsteps, in the footsteps of someone that you look up to, like your own father. But the story that Terry told is very true, and there was another reason for him being the way he was toward us. Because if I came out of the ring, and this happened to me in in Albuquerque with Nelson Royal, I went in the ring and I wrestled Nelson Royal, and uh, I just did a fair job. And the door opened in the dressing room. I came in. And my father jumped all over me, you know, and right in front of all the other wrestlers and everything. But do you know what happened when my father left the room? All the other guys in the dressing room got up and said, hey, kid, you really didn't do so bad, you know? Because he had that way of turning people's opinion about me so that I got a lot of support. And I didn't get all that uh, business of people saying, well, his father's making it easy for him. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Exactly. So, Maybe it was a, a hard way to go or a reputation to live up to, but he was able to handle it psychologically so that it wasn't so bad. There were a lot of guys would come up and say, hey, you know, I know he's on you, but uh, you really did a great job out there. And they were encouraging right. to us. So he had a good way about him. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure. The only pressure really was what we might put on ourselves. Right. Well, how about you know, this? I have a lot of admiration. I'm telling you the truth, Les. I have a lot of admiration for you, I have a lot of admiration for Nelson Royal. I have a lot of admiration for a lot of the young wrestlers in the profession today. And the reason I do have a lot of admiration for them is because they didn't come up through the second generation of wrestling, which my brother and I did. Because believe me, we had a, we got a five year head start on all of you guys because you had to go and make yourself known across the country, whereas he had met Every promoter throughout the United States was on a first name basis with him and he could call him up and say, hey, this is my kid. Immediately you walked in there and they knew who you were. Yes, when you got there, you better produce and you better produce well, which I felt like my brother Dory and I have done through the years in professional wrestling and we have given the people their money's worth, but it was tougher on you guys because you had to go get known in every area throughout the United States because that's what it was before, is well, this areas is true. and territories. But then one thing, and I was going to ask you about this, uh, not the pressure. And it was from much your... harder to get in the wrestling profession. Oh, yes, to open the door. I agree. Much harder. I agree. Because you had to be a, a, a certain type of individual. They, uh, believe me, to even get into a professional wrestling ring, you had to have some recommendations and you had to have some credentials. Credentials in wrestling, uh, credentials in, 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 in your actual. Uh, being a good person, 
I mean, there was qualities. We wanted quality people. The, the older wrestlers at that time, they kind of governed the thing, and they would kind of uh, get screen rid of the, it. screen it out. They'd screen it out, believe me. And, and really, I feel like the credentials were much more then for wrestling and probably in all other professional sports. Now, you know, it's, a, it, it, it's not quite the same because uh, it's not uh, how many years have you wrestled amateur, how many years have you been in college, or uh, how many years have you done this, or how many years have, have you worked at that. Right now, it's kind of a sad situation to me because you get some of these wrestling schools around the country and uh, they'll ask you, say, well, what have you done? Say, well, I've been to Penn five years or whatever it is. Well, that doesn't hurt anything, you know. I mean, that's all right. Have you got three thousand dollars? Yeah, I got three thousand. Well, it's okay, you know. And it, you're a wrestler. Better. I'm telling you, that's 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 a sad situation about it because oh, I agree. we we have to. Before it was a much more closed profession than it is in this day and age. How did you feel? Okay. Okay. Let me know. How did I feel when what? I don't feel one more. I was going to ask you how you felt about when Glory won the title. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. What was no. your feeling about no. him being the champion and the fact no. that you would like to be the same thing, but did you want to wrestle your brother? No. I mean, you, in one way no. it would make you look good, but another way you'd be embarrassing your brother no. if you were to be. Let me ask you this, Terry. Dory was the first to wear the coveted National Wrestling Alliance <coughs> Championship of the World. How did you feel about him being the champion? Of course, like any of us who were pros, you, everybody, that was the pinnacle for all of us. That was our, our high water mark of being the world champion. You wanted to be it, but if you well, beat your brother, you would have embarrassed him and made yourself look good at the same time. And we were so close at that time, my brother and my father and myself, and it re really was a culmination of a career. It was, I mean, of all of our careers. Right. Whenever he won that, we were so thrilled about it because he won that championship. And whenever he did, I mean, we were on top of the world. Not, not just him, but we all were. And we were very proud of him at that time and uh, thrilled that he had the opportunity to wear that thing around his waist and defend it around the country. And I, I don't think that there's anybody that can disagree with me that knows anything about wrestling and knows anything about the past of wrestling and everything else. I, and I'm not bragging or anything, but. And, and including myself and all of your other NWA champions, is I feel like he wore the belt better than anybody. Well, and I felt like he did a better job many. of defending it. And yes, it's been yes, said by and many. with a, with a whole lot of dignity. And uh, and I'll tell you what, I, I think that uh, he maintained a higher dignity with the belt and uh, uh, really did a lot for his profession at that time. And if you want to look at the 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 profession looked at as a sport, I believe that. In that era that he had that championship, I think it was more highly recognized as a sport than it ever had been before. Um, we're talking about him going to every major city across the United States and every coliseum that he would go into. Well, let's mention too, you know, for the fans who aren't old enough, so that the National Wrestling Alliance legitimately had affiliates in Europe, South America, and Japan. Yes. And when you were the world champion in those days, you went to other countries. You defended. Sure, that could have been an all-time low whenever I was champion. <laughs> <laughs> but it was at an all-time high, all-time high when he was champion. Well, yeah, right. I really, okay. I really figure he did. For four and a half years, he ran around. He defended that thing, and, and he did a better job. And I mean, what great matches took place around him from from Tennessee whenever he would come into here and wrestle. Uh, uh, Whitey Caldwell. Whitey Caldwell. He right. wrestled Whitey Caldwell to uh, going down to Florida in the, in the Briscoe feuds and right. going up to Oregon and, and, it was and a different pace Jimmy wrestler Snook at every that day time. And a, and, and a different and, environment. And a different totally. wrestler in a different exactly. environment. Now you get these, now you get your champions today and they might wrestle five wrestlers, different wrestlers a year. Well, hell, of he course, wrestled over a hundred Terry, Terry made a point there. Four and a half years. In this day and age, all the world has picked up uh, speed and there's no champion that's going to sit on a belt for four and a half. I mean, when I say, I don't mean any disrespect when I say sit on, but to hold a title for that. Period. For four and a half years. I, I was listening to what uh, Terry was saying, and I, it just came to mind, you know, that I thought I'd throw this out. Uh, being the older brother, you know, like I'm three and a half years older than Terry, well, I got the opportunity, opportunity to do a lot of things 
first, and he was like uh, coming along second. There's advantages and disadvantages. There, yeah, there is. Oh, sure. And when, when, and I, when I first uh, went out for the football team, I was in the seventh grade, you know, and the old coach would come around and he'd say, all right, you guys, I want six push-ups. And we'd get down, and some of us could do six push-ups, push and some of us couldn't. They'd say, well, I want some wind sprints, you know. And I really, I mean, and then, and then we'd say, well, I want some contact practice, uh, head-on tackling. Seventh, eighth grade, I thought, man, this stuff is tough. Wait till my brother gets here. He'll never make it. And sure enough, my brother would come along like three and a half years later. He wouldn't only make it as well, he'd do a better job. And the same, and it, things kind of went through that, that same <laughs> <Not really>. situation <laughs> all the way because all of a sudden I'm world's champion, Not you know, really. <laughs> traveling every night, defending that belt every night, facing uh, uh, Lord knows who's, who you're going to face from, from King Curtis to uh, Ox Baker to Grizzly Smith to Jack Briscoe to... Uh, Paddle Connor, you know, and I'm thinking, Johnny, boy, if my brother were here, he'd really think this is tough, you know. <laughs> right. Sure enough, uh, after after I lost the belt to uh, to Harley Race, it wasn't uh, what two and a half, three years later. All of a sudden, he's world's champion, and it really uh, he really did a great job with it. And I think he probably set more <laughs> more records in, in many of the in many yeah, of the coliseums. Sure did. I drank more beers than that. <laughs> <laughs> The, the fastest driver and the biggest beer drinker. <laughs> Harley Race would have to argue with me. Who would you say in your four and a half year run? Well, obviously, Harley beats you for the title. Would he be the, the very best that you met in that period of time? Or give me the. Oh, I, th I think Harley, uh, Harley was. I'd have to put Harley Race, Jack Briscoe. And then in the different places that you went, there were, there were some very tough, tough wrestlers, too, that were local and uh, didn't move around too much. And some of them are actually gone. Uh, uh, down, down here was uh, the case with Whitey Caldwell. I wouldn't say uh, Whitey Caldwell was one of the greatest wrestlers that I ever wrestled, but uh, he darn sure had one of the biggest hearts. I was just going to say. Uh, well, don't you think too that a lot of times a guy like that who wasn't getting national recognition, he had nothing to lose, so he could throw all the stops out. And yes. You were the guy yes. who had to go in there and prove something actually, because if he got beat, it was no big deal. I mean, people expected that a lot of times. Yes. You know what was really funny to me, though, is, is like uh, we're talking about the, you know, that question comes up to me so often is who was the toughest or who was the best? And I'll sit there in this day and I'll say, I can answer that. And I will answer it. If you take the toughest, as I feel like Jack Briscoe was the very smoothest, best wrestler yeah. that I faced. You take Abdullah the Butcher, Abdullah the Butcher in his prime was probably the most vicious wrestler that I ever faced. Harley Race was probably the hard-headedest, hard-headedest, most determined uh, <laughs> uh, wrestler that you've ever met. I mean, believe me, what he didn't have in talent, he made up for in desire. And he came up, Harley did, from the School of Hard Knocks. He didn't have right. any education, formal education. He just walked into wrestling as and at a very young age of 14 and made it and did right. well. And that's, I admire that in him. And, and I, came and back I, from quite a few uh, disasters in his life, losing a, a yeah. wife and, and a yeah. bad car wreck and then, I mean, things like that. And still to come back and become the athlete that he was was uh, quite a tribute. Yeah. And, and, and I, at times in my life, I have had the same faults that he has, and I know Junior has too, that we have had our love for the professional wrestling business, God only knows why, has been greater than anything else. And uh, that's not good. It's not good. And hopefully, as I've changed something. <laughs> <laughs> the name Briscoe keeps coming up. I remember in 1971, uh, wrestling out of the Tampa office, that all of us in the dressing room and Fort Hesterly Armory and, and uh, Tampa, when the Briscoe brothers and the Funk brothers squared off, we all came out of the dressing room to watch it. And I'm gonna say it was some of the greatest tag matches I ever saw. And I always thought, of course, now I have a chance to ask, that a lot of it was the sibling thing. One yes. brother, I mean, the, not yeah. only the two brothers could work as one, yeah. but the fact younger brother trying to top older brother and that sort of thing. But those matches were classics, I think, every one of them. Well, they, they yeah, were, but Gerald was awful dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Gerald, if you're listening, <laughs> Terry's teasing. <laughs> I hope. 
Yeah, look at him now. He's working for WWF. <laughs> Uh, Dory, what were you going to say? <laughs> well, I, th I think it's just family pride. I mean, those guys were great athletes. They you know, were, I, uh, I would love to go back to that. I mean, and let some of the fans today see some of them. I mean, uh, talk about smooth. Uh, I mean, of course, here again, you got the, the, those two and you two growing up together was almost like you thought as one. You could knew what he was going to do before he knew sometimes. Well, I think it comes, and maybe it comes from this. In those days, and, and there is a difference in wrestling now and, and wrestling back then. And uh, some of us have been very fortunate to be able to make the transition. Some of the, some of the wrestlers are, were unable to make the transition. Right. But uh, I think back then, your that basic uh, amateur wrestling background had to be there. Uh, that was absolutely necessary to, to become a professional wrestler. Of course, in, in Briscoe's case, that was there in, in aces, right? Well, sure. They were great amateur wrestlers. Uh, I know Jack went to Oklahoma State. In, uh, well, he was twice Big A champion, I think, wasn't he? He was twice NCAA champion, which is really something. Uh, Jerry, I'm not sure, but I know he was following in his brother's footsteps. I'm not sure if Jerry went to Oklahoma State or not. I really don't know. But he was a great amateur wrestler. Well, I think he, he ended up with hepatitis in his, what, his sophomore, junior year. was in intensive yeah. care a long time. Yeah. He, he had, had a, kind he of, had of move curtailed out of yeah. his amateur career. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, I want to explain something to these people, too. And I think that this is a very important thing and uh, that you understand what we are talking about. We are talking about professional wrestling. And professional wrestling is a wonderful thing that has, uh, has come about through the years. And, and what it is, is it is a combination of sports and pure sport and entertainment. And over here is entertainment and over here is sport. And the pendulum swings and it swings back and forth constantly. And you see it swing from one way to the other. Right now I'd like to say that I feel that there is a little bit more entertainment than there has been in the past in some organizations. But that doesn't mean you're not going to find another prime, prime uh, athlete that appears on a scene like a Jack Briscoe that is a pure, pure, wonderful wrestler with this great ability that is going to swing that pendulum back all the way the other way. Right. And I think as wrestling fans that uh, I think that there is that that is that pendulum will swing both ways, and, and I, I truly believe that on the horizon we're going to find this kind of athlete that will come into it because of the amount and the amount of money that can be made in our profession. It becomes more and more attractive right. as time goes along. Well, you know, sitting right here with and, you two guys, you've got two talking about pendulums, two basically different styles. I mean. Junior, you've always been more the calm. We, we always running. have. We always right. we did. Yeah, we did grow up and with Terry. Now wait a minute. That's a matter of opinion. <laughs> well, it I is, am the it guy is, with all of that fluid of wrestling opinion. motion. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a straw vote here. <laughs> yeah, wait a but, minute. Uh, you know, Whoa! I remember. Patrick. I remember your your dad saying one time uh, years ago. Uh, the three of you, we were we were uh, in a restaurant, I believe, and it was with a cashier or something. She said, "Oh, are you related?" And he said, well, he and I are, but I don't know who he belongs to because he's as flamboyant as your dad was, and you were more, more calm. In fact, the most calm Texan I think I've ever met. Is <laughs> the calmest Texan I've ever met. Now, how do, how do you, I mean, you know, like living with this and then your dad being more flamboyant as well, uh, how, did, how did you feel about that? Well, I was uh, kind of trying to just go down the road and, and do what I like to do. You know, and, and, yeah, and I was very close to my fr father, and I'm very close to my brother, and uh, we don't really have a conflict. Uh, if we go in the ring as a tag team, well, we're going to look after each other, and uh, I'm going to know where he is. He's going to know where I am. We're going, and I think we're a great tag team. Uh, oh, I do too. We will go in the ring and uh, and wrestle our own styles too, at the same time. Right. Oh, I've seen that. I've and seen it. and uh, I, I think that's what's made some of your opponents uh, look very bad because you're making them shift gears yeah. as you do. Yeah, I mean, we're not going to go in there. Uh, they're not going to see Terry and I in uh, probably not even the same jacket, the same color tights, right. uh, the same 
shoes and the same hat. I well, mean, we're, we're different people, right, sure. Right. Yeah, exactly. You're being here. And uh, what you're bringing out, I think, is something that's uh, becoming good for professional wrestling right now. And it's, it's, it's changing just as we're talking. Uh, you've got WCW that has a, has a certain style. You've got WWF that has a certain style. You've got Smoky, Smoky Mountain. The, the, when the fans come to Smoky Mountain Wrestling, they have a choice. Very true. They have a choice to watch very something true. different. And uh, the other uh, alliance that's doing very well is ECW. And boy, when you walk in the ring there, you better be ducking. Because it's, <laughs> you know. So, but, oh, but, but, it's, but, it, but it's different. And it, more and diverse, I mean, as the world is. Today. Well, the fans have a choice now. I mean, sure. uh, and, you know, and I think it's better. Uh, when, when I was champion and we had, we, uh, we were, when we were both champion, there were at least 22 different major outfits in the United States that all had individual personalities. Sure. And uh, I think for, uh, for a while, uh, the choices were too small. And I think it's uh, very good now that, uh, that there are four, four major organizations. I think it's also good that there are some other ones coming up too now. I think it's a very good They concern. have, they have. And, and that, you know, Smoky Mountain has come along leaps and bounds on the wrestling horizon and what just this legends week that they have had has been so, so lucrative to them. And it's been so uh, eye-opening throughout the world of professional wrestling. I mean, it was covered by the Japanese papers, covered by every, almost every country covered right. the thing, seriously. People from Canada. And, and all, all of a sudden, country. I mean, all of a sudden, sure. as it's, uh, it was a wonderful thing for Smoky Mountain. And, and it and, basically brought a lot of these fans from different wrestling cultures together to see something that they all had gravitated to simply because they were interested in it. And I think that, uh, um, you know, and I'm going to tell you, as I love Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And I think it's a, a, a great form and a great style, and I think that the uh, people should be proud of what is being produced right in this area here. I want to change gears a moment and get into your film career, and film background. Uh, you were one of the very first to get a featured role in motion pictures. What was the name of that? Deep Throat or something? <laughs> <laughs> Were you the star of that? No, no, let's take that one out of it. Okay. Okay, okay start that again. Start that again, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you were one of the very first wrestlers to get a featured role in a major motion picture, and that was in Sylvester Stallone's Paradise Alley, which was about pro wrestling in the 40s. And you were the star bad guy who took on Stallone's brother in the the great finale match at the end of the movie. And of course, you've done other films too. Tell us a little bit about your career in films. Uh, you know, it, it, it's really been a, it's, it's, it's been a very fun thing for me. And it's also been a very disheartening thing at times too. I guess everything's like that, you know, it's had its ups and its downs, you know, but uh, a real up was doing Paradise LA with Sylvester Stallone. And uh, uh, I enjoyed that immensely. And then after that one went by, well then I, kind of thought that I was just supposed to get those roles. You know, I was looking for this big goof and I just walked out there and they said, boy, you know, you're the guy, you know, let's put you in this movie. You're wonderful, you know, and then I kept on thinking, well, when's the next movie going to come around and do the same thing? So I kind of sat around for about a year, a year and a half. Phone and phone, it wasn't ringing. The phone never rang or nothing. So I went back to wrestling business. So about three years later, I'm sitting out in the middle of nowhere in Canyon, Texas. And I get another call, you know, and and it's, uh, again, as it's a very lucky, fortunate thing, is uh, there was a Disney series coming up called Wild Side. And uh, I got to do, I got to do it that. It was short-lived, but I enjoyed it. I watched it, was, it, it had it was some great good. actors and actresses, and one of them was Meg Ryan, and a great, of course, that was one of the great actresses, and great actors was me, and uh, <laughs> Howard Rollins, you know, and John D'Aquino, and a couple, and William Smith, and... Well, that's right. But it was... Rollins uh, went on to, to star in some, some great features. Yes, you know, yes, and, he, and he'd just done Soldier Boy prior to that, you know, which is a... Something you and I were talking about before we started this taping was the fact that you have actually written some movie scripts. Uh, yes, I have. As uh, We wrote one script myself and a fellow by the name of Art, Arthur Chabanian, which sold. And uh, sold for like $450,000. That's great. So yeah. every, what they see in the ring is not the only Terry Funk that we know then. There, there's a very diverse gentleman under that uh, wild exterior. Not really. 
Not really. He's a very boring man. <laughs> yeah, just, well, yeah, uh, well, I, I, I could say diverse, I could say diverse is a big word. You know? <laughs> I mean, that means you got you know. Yeah, but I, yeah, I, 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 excuse me, Junior, but yeah, you know, is it, it, is the whole thing about it is what a lot of people don't say, and you say, well, I did the first major deal in it, but this is very similar to wrestling in its own way. It's totally you cannot relate to it because people say, well, you talk on television, I'm talking on television to you. But the movies are totally different right. because you are talking and you are saying verbatim two lines. Well, I hate and to what give you we a don't understand but, to do that. But let me let me tell you something. <laughs> but what we don't understand, what we don't understand it's like playing a concerto on a piano. You can't walk out there and just play a concerto sure. on a piano. You have to learn how to do it. And that's the same thing that I really didn't understand when I first got in the movie business, that I had to learn and spend time with acting. And I was competing against guys whenever they were five years old that had started in the business and people that had been in it all of their lives like I had been in the wrestling business. And but so therefore, when I did realize that, and I said I sat out there a long time doing nothing, but I finally realized that you have to study, you have to work at it. And again, it's this persistence and hard work that gets you anywhere. And that's the only way that I was ever able to become successful in that business. You pursued it just like you pursued wrestling. The only way you the can. With vengeance, so to speak. And it's the way that you kids out there should do the same thing. You should pursue something. Pick it out and don't ever take no for an answer because persistence has a lot to do with it. You were about to say something. Well, what, he, what, he, what he's uh, saying is very true. I just want to say that uh, acting is hard. I mean, uh, I was at home and he had been, uh, he had hit Paradise Alley and Wild Side and quite a few others. So my wife says, well, let's go down and take an acting course. You can do it too. You know, so we went down and uh, went down to Orlando, Florida. <laughs> and I took an impromptu acting course. And boy, they walk in there and they give you a script and they say, okay, go step out and you got three minutes and I want you to come back up here and give it to this camera. And I tried that. You know, and, and I've wrestled for a long time. I've been in the banking business. I've been in the, the cattle business. I've done a lot of things that are hard. And I thought, well, this can't be too hard. And boy, I'll tell you what, I sweated some bullets. And I've got a videotape. <laughs> I've got a videotape of myself. Don't let Les have it. <laughs> I've got, no, at home, and it's staying right there. Ain't nobody going to see, nobody's gonna see that. You no. are magnificent. <laughs> what, what you're saying that but what I'm saying when you want to be is what you see yourself, when you, you, look, at when you look at these people. <laughs> when you look at these people on screen, and it comes off so natural, it's a hard son of a gun to do. And you run into the same thing in wrestling. Sure. People will come up to me and they'll say, well, I want to be a wrestler, you know. Absolutely. And, uh, so do a lot of well, yeah, people. Well, yeah, so do a lot of people. Yeah. And, my, and my answer is usually, well, it's uh, probably about $25 for a license and get in there and try it. <laughs> really? You know? But really, 60 seconds but the truth it. is, <laughs> the truth is, it's a, it's a whole lot of hard work. Sure. Exactly. And, well, uh, I, I think with any uh, upfront sports entertainment at a professional level, people just see the glamour of it. They don't realize the. Uh, they don't realize that. We, yeah, and I thought in well, the trenches type of thing that's going that's on, right. and the hours and hours of hard work to get to that. The point. trenches include a lot of things. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they do. Of which we will not speak. <laughs> Let's uh, t bring us up to date. Both you guys uh, wrestled through a time we're talking about, which was a lot different than today. You both had to shift gears a little bit, although you have brought, and I'm very proud to say, our style to the 1990s. Uh, each one of you take a turn here and tell me how you feel you've had to adjust to some degree to fit into the 90s uh, scene under professional wrestling. Level. So the biggest adjustment I've made is uh, training. Because uh, when I was uh, world champion, I was wrestling every night. Uh, I was young, that kept me in shape. Right. Uh, I could stay out all night, I could uh, get up the next morning, get in the ring, and just automatically I was a wrestler. Uh, as you get older, it becomes more and more hard work. Sure. You have to train for it, you have to prepare for it, uh, and uh, it takes a whole lot more work when you get older, I'll tell you that. Uh, and we have to walk in the ring with people uh, uh, many years younger, at least I do, and I'll tell you what, it, it puts a lot of pressure on you because you don't want those young kids showing you up. Exactly. So, well, and, uh, and you've got a, a heck of a background to defend them too. Uh, I, 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 I think the training for it is a lot different. So you feel that uh, more cardiovascular, maybe more weight training, you're just, you're just 
try to like any other athlete today, a little better nutrition, a little better training. Oh yes, yeah, so yeah, a yeah. little less, yeah, a little less. Well, actually, no alcohol now, you know, right. but uh, a little less of uh, everything and a little more training. Exactly. And how yeah. about you? Over there? And that's not to say we did. I didn't train a lot <clears throat> well, in sure. the beginning, no, like you know. Saying, but I think, I think but I it's like, even more. As you you mentioned wrestling every night, and and th for those who don't know. Uh, professional wrestling, you're in that ring 20 minutes a half hour. With the champions sometimes as much as 60 minutes, this is extreme cardiovascular oh, yes. exercise. I mean, yes. you talk about a treadmill for 20 minutes, that's a walk in the park compared to what we're talking about here. You know, I'm exactly what he says, you know, because I'm, I'm going to tell you, is, is, uh, I still consider myself a great athlete. I consider Junior a great athlete, and I'm speaking for myself, but personally, is, yeah, you know, as I've had some better days. You know? <laughs> these old knees don't move like they used to, and these old elbows don't work quite as well as they did. You know, and this doggone shoulder is awful sore, and that and this, you know, but boy, the old heart's still there. But yeah, you have to train a lot harder the older that you get, like we're talking about. But then switching over to another aspect of our business is the business itself has changed drastically. Sure. What changed the professional wrestling business from being an an area business, and whenever I say an area business, I'm talking about they used to have wrestling in Texas, wrestling in Oklahoma, wrestling in Tennessee, wrestling, all governed wrestling by different in offices. Florida, all governed by different areas. What changed all of that is the satellites. And when the satellites came up, well, all of a sudden came the superstation. And then all of a sudden came the New York superstation, and they're beaming out this stuff all over the country, and, and, and it really eliminated all of your other places because it's just like Walmart, you know, an old the old five and ten cent store downtown is all of a sudden Walmart comes into town and they've got this big huge store with all this stuff in it. You might get a better deal at the other place but it's new, uh, uh, but Walmart stuff is new and this stuff is old and they've got this and this place don't have that, it's flashier, they've got national advertisement. Well that's kind of the same thing that just went on around there, you know, yeah. and just kind of ran over everything like and, and don't, don't for you feel a certain part of this now, it's like you mentioned the satellite. You've got 150 yeah. stations, you sit there channel surfing. Yeah. So to get somebody's attention and hold it, you've yeah. got to be quicker. Yes, to, to, exactly. You've to, got to, to gain their attention. You've, you've, you've got to be, and you've got to be more higher quality. Right. And what happened is we had uh, maybe one organization that took off with it and took control of the ball. Then we had uh, uh, these, these huge uh, corporate structures that got into it. So we've have maybe only two organizations left like this. But now what we've got, which is a, which is kind of a just a, kind of the sun coming up, is you know Smoky Mountain, is uh, these other organizations that are coming up, and I do believe that they are going to continue to grow. That's very important for the health of our profession, and I think that they are so much of a necessity for our profession to evolve and move along in a good progressive way. Where do you see the business five years down the road, Dora? Oh, I see uh, naturally uh, bigger and bigger gates. Uh, I see bigger pay-per-views, maybe worldwide pay-per-views, uh, worldwide distribu dis distribution. I mean, we, we watched our business go from uh, the Texas area and the Oklahoma and the Kansas City, what we've been talking about, the local areas to the national, it probably will go worldwide. <laughs> and it, I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you what you have to be careful for. When wrestling went nat national, a few wrestlers made a lot more money, but a whole lot of wrestlers didn't do so well. And if, no. wrestling, if wrestling goes worldwide, uh, it's, we still are going to need the Smoky Mountains, the ECW, yeah, and the WWF, WCW, the Japanese organizations, the uh, European organizations, because if we're not careful and if we let one organization take everything, we'll see a trimming down again, and you'll see a very few wrestlers making very big money and a whole bunch of other wrestlers unemployed. Well, don't you think, too, we're talking about the smaller areas that are called uh, independents. I think that the thing you miss from all the territories from uh, the old NWA days is developing talent. 
the two major organizations, are, you got to take a guy who doesn't have a chance to build a background and throw him to the wolves, so to speak. Yes. And he doesn't have a chance to develop, and you need the smaller uh, areas for that man to develop his talent. Let me, I 100% I, I agree with that, but let me clarify is what Go Junior ahead. means by worldwide because he, he went into that, but I, he, he and I have talked about this several times, but worldwide is a little bit different. We're worldwide right now, but organizations are and everything. We're talking about all the different organizations. But the thing about worldwide that we're talking about, we're talking about worldwide through fiber optics. Right. We're talking about worldwide whenever you go ahead and you can go out to the rural and the uh, uh, areas of the United States and be able to plug your telephone into a, uh, your TV into a telephone jack and pick up any pay-per-view of anything that you want throughout the world with dozens and dozens of, of, of pay-per-views of, of anything else. And, and that is what we're talking about worldwide. That's the next progression of professional wrestling is that right now we have got these big, huge arenas that aren't the Orange Bowls, that aren't the Rose Bowls. They, they are arenas that have got millions upon millions of seats through pay-per-view that we can sell these tickets to throughout. But now whenever it becomes worldwide, we're gonna have billions of people that we can sell these tickets to. And that's why on a worldwide basis, you're gonna have so much of a increase in, in, in revenue. In fact, I'm explain, uh, we're going out to a, another plateau is what we're talking about. One other thing that uh, you brought up to uh, where are we gonna find the, uh, the new young wrestlers? The only way that, that a wrestler can really learn his craft well is to be in that ring wrestling. And uh, I don't mean on uh, one big show for, uh, for one big wrestling company. You've got to be there like he and I and you, you started. You have to have an yeah. amateur you gotta, background. You have to have that. And whenever you have this money and this value coming into our profession, that you, they see where you can make more and more money. We're going to draw from that group more and more and more. We have to have guys with amateur backgrounds to go into the professionals to preserve the sports. I'm talking about guys like the Steiner. I'm talking about yeah. like the you know like the Armstrong kids. They've had good amateur backgrounds, uh, but there's there's numbers of them out there right now. But I'm saying let's keep on drawing from that group. Let's exactly. get those guys. That's what we want. We want the cream of the crop. But in order to give it to the cream of the crop, when you're talking about football, where they're making $5 million a year for a contract, this guy, and this guy's signing for $20 million for four years, we've got to get in the ball game with right. them. We have got to pull the best. In order to pull the best, we've got to increase the gates. In order to increase the gates, we've got to enlarge our arenas. Whenever I say enlarge our arenas, I'm talking about the masses through pay-per-view to where we can compete and pull the greatest athletes in the world into our profession. And that's what we're hoping I for. Think well said. And that's what we would have to do. I would tend to agree 100 percent with you. What happens? Are you sure you do? Well, with, with you, I'm never sure of anything. <laughs> it's minute to minute. Boy, I got out there for a minute, and I was getting cosmic. You've been out I there. I was getting cosmic <laughs> at that time. You were born out there. Yeah. <laughs> Dory. When you're ready to, to have those wrestling boots bronze and use them as a doorstop, you've talked, you mentioned some banking, you mentioned the cattle. Oh, I, stuff. What, do you, what do you figure you're going to oh, do? I've, uh, I've gone into several different professions, but uh, I probably will wrestle as long as I enjoy it. And, uh, as long as it's see, Yeah, people ask me all the time. Uh, you know, I, I began, I thought, uh, first I told uh, my mother, I said, uh, Mom, I'm going to stay in the professional wrestling business, make as much money as I can and when I'm 32 I'm quitting you know and it just doesn't work that way the the opportunities there or the needs there one or the other and uh, I've been in the mortgage business and uh, looked up and thanked the Lord that I was in the mortgage business and I've seen the recession hit and uh, just looked up and thanked the Lord that the wrestling business was still here so I you know I really uh, I really can't say if there's a win or if there's a what next uh, I'm going to continue doing what I like doing and uh, right now it's uh, professional wrestling. I'm involved in some other things. Uh, uh, You're basically confused. Well, just, just recently, uh, I just finished teaching a Japanese class in, uh, at uh, Central Florida Community College down in uh, Okella. Really had a good time uh, with that. And 
I might look at that alongside of wrestling, but I'm still going to be a part of professional wrestling at least as long as I enjoy it and uh, as long as I can feel good about doing it. And I don't really put, I, I don't really put a cap or a lid or an age lid on uh, doing anything. Well, I think it is too. Whether it's, it's but, that, but whether it's wrestling or, or, or no matter what it is, you know, I'm not ready to put an age limit to it or a time limit to it. As long as like, you're still doing what I see you doing in the ring now, there's no reason for you to quit. And uh, you over there, younger brother, uh, writing movies, uh, starring in your own series, uh, what's it like? Really, you know, as I've always said, that I, and Junior <coughs> feels this way too, as long as I can go ahead and go out there and perform and, and uh, um, not be an embarrassment to my family, to my friends, or anything like that, and, and say, boy, he's doing a heck of a job, well, I, 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 I want to do that, and, and yet is, uh, I am really, really, really looking at uh, maybe, you know, I, I, and I know when, not when that'll be, but I, I just have a feeling that it's not going to be that much longer. With oh, me. Really? And, I, and, and I really mean that, and that's not, uh, I thought yeah. maybe you might be the Gaylord Perry. Well, that's the thing I, did. I think old Gaylord is just kind of just fixing to ease out of his chair right now, you know. But yeah, and uh, you know, it's, yeah, I want to. Yeah, I. It becomes whenever you physically, and believe me, this truth, whenever you physically hurt, it becomes harder and harder to enjoy, you know. And and I do, as I want to give, and I think that you'll agree with this, is that, and I know Les is the same way that I am, and Junior is too is whenever somebody buys that ticket, and I don't care how many people are out there, I don't care if there's a snowstorm and only 50 show up, they pay the same price as if there was 10,000 people there. And when those people come to that arena, I want to give them their money's worth. And, but sometimes, physically speaking, because of injuries through the years, you can't quite do that. Oh, I agree. And uh, I'm getting, I'll give them their money's worth for it. One final question. I'm but it hurts. For last. It hurts. What's the uh, story behind the goofy baseball cap? Well, I'll tell you what the story is that. It's a pretty good story there. You see old Goofy right there? That reminds everybody, and it should rem it, that reminds me. And it should remind some people that I know, and maybe an organization that I know, the same thing. Just because you find a dog turd in a Disney parking lot, it doesn't mean it's Goofy's. <laughs> Think about that. Gentlemen, I want to say... You followed that, didn't you? I followed that. He followed I'm that. I'm sorry to say I followed well, that. Let's hope everybody else out there didn't. I want to make one statement that uh, over my career, you guys have been uh, a good portion of my highlight film and you have made the business, the sport of professional wrestling, so I can be proud of, of being a wrestler and being a commentator at this point in time. It's been a heck of a trip, hasn't it? Lance? It certainly has, and we've had a lot of fun along the way. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I want to thank you both for joining us, and I want to say to the fans, if you have never had a chance to watch Dory and Terry in action before they decide to hang it up and sell goofy baseball caps, got one. please take the shot at watching the Funk Brothers in the squared circle. Do the ending? How far, uh, how far back? Very good, guys. Very good.